Well, I'd love to welcome you all to Spine Talks. This is our series on disc replacements, and specifically, we're going to talk about cervical disc replacements right now. Disc replacements are something that's relatively new in the world, and we're going to bring experts to you. The National Spine Health Foundation has a medical and scientific board, which is comprised of the nation's best physicians. And we're going to speak to some of them tonight about their experience, which is vast, about cervical disc replacements. So my name is Dr. Tom Schuler. I'm a spinal surgeon. I'm CEO of the Virginia Spine Institute and president of the National Spine Health Foundation. And I've been doing cervical disc replacements for almost 20 years. Next, we're going to ask Dr. Todd Landman to talk about his experience and his background. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, I also have been in practice 30 years of spinal neurosurgery in Los Angeles in uh, Beverly Hills at Cedar sinai and uh, faculty at UCLA. And I also have been involved in artificial disc replacement from the early 2000s, involved in the clinical trials and the cervicals and lumbars for uh, most of the discs. So we've had quite a, a long, uh, many years of experience as well as having some personal implantations into myself. So we can enlighten everyone about that. All right, next from the great state of Texas, Rick Geyer. Rick, can you tell us about your background? Sure, thanks, Tom. We've been doing disc replacement, uh, having done my first one in 2000. So it's 21 years since we've been doing lumbar and then followed with cervical in the early 2000s. So like Todd, we've been involved in, I think, over a dozen FDA trials testing both lumbar and cervical discs. And Armin from the snowy uh, state of Salt Lake City and uh, Utah. Well, thank you, Tom, again, for inviting me today. And uh, unfortunately, today is about 100 degrees outside. So I wish it was a little bit colder and a little bit nicer. But uh, uh, I have now been in practice for almost 20 years. I'm the founder and director of the Disc Replacement Center here in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm very passionate about this technology. I've been focusing on it for almost 15 years now. I've been involved in five different clinical trials, uh, all of them in the cervical spine. Uh, it's, it's a technology that I think is a game changer for our patients. I've had uh, just a tremendous number of patients who come back are incredibly happy with this particular procedure. And I'd love to kind of answer any questions that any of our patients would have regarding this technology. What is a disc? I mean, we're talking about disc replacements. What, what is a disc? What is a normal disc? And what does it do? A normal disc has two parts. It has the nucleus, which is the center, and then it has the rim, which is called the annulus. And when you get a rupture or a herniation, then they're, they're really describing the same pathology. So a rupture is when the ring tears, a herniation is when the soft jelly or the nucleus comes out and then pinches a nerve that will give you the shoulder pain, the arm pain, numbness and tingling. So typically, um, you know, most people don't have a problem, but after the age of 40, about 40 to 50% of patients will show some varying degrees of degeneration of the disc. And fortunately, only a small percent end up getting herniated disc that then get what we call the arm pain or what we commonly term as radiculopathy. So Todd, what is an artificial disc? We talk about a normal disc, this this elastic fiber structure that holds bones together, allows them to move. What, what's an artificial disc and why do we have them? Well, these artificial discs were designed really to replace the degenerative and herniated discs that are in the neck. Traditionally, we would remove the disc to decompress the nerves and relieve the patient's pain and then fuse it by putting a bone graft or a material with the plate and screws to lock it which really provided a little less motion of the spine and the outcomes were, were very good. However, as the total knee and total hip community found out, you know, in, in the old days when you had a bad knee and hip, they were fused back in the day. And then nobody would consider having a hip fusion or a knee fusion today. The reason we get away with doing a fusion traditionally in the cervical spine is you have five discs. So if you fuse one or two, well, you have three other ones that keep moving. Invariably, that increases the stress on the other discs and they fail. So artificial discs are devices that mimic motion of the natural disc. So when we remove the bad disc, we insert an artificial disc, which is typically made up of titanium end plate components and a core of high molecular weight polyethylene. Typically, there are other types of discs that are FDA approved that have different core constraints and mobilities. So these discs allow you to maintain your motion of the spine, but yet 
relieve the pressure on the pinched nerves and provide stability, provide pain relief, and improve your neurologic condition. Why have an artificial disc? If we have fusions and they've been done for years, don't they work? Why do an artificial disc? Common sense would tell you that if you can preserve the motion that was naturally there, that is going to give you a better outcome, right? So again, as Todd mentioned, for a long time, we did not have the proper technology in place. And really the only option that we had available to us was fusion. We now have had a number of different clinical trials uh, comparing disc replacements to fusion. And in almost every single clinical trial, the disc replacements are found to be at least equivalent and in many cases superior to fusion when it comes to what happens to patients in terms of their functional outcomes, what happens to their, uh, what happens to uh, future surgeries that the patients may need as, as they recover from the original surgery itself. So with artificial discs, we are able to preserve the natural motion that's normally there. Uh, many times, again, what uh, uh, Dr. Geyer mentioned was that you have a herniated disc that's pinching a nerve that's causing horrible pain down the arm that may cause weakness or numbness. And, uh, and these patients who come to us needing surgery, now we have the option of giving that, that pain relief, but then also preserving the function that's there and that function being motion. Uh, and again, uh, this is something that now we've been doing for almost uh, 20 years in this country. Uh, for the past 15 years or so, we've had FDA approved discs available in this country uh, that uh, now can provide our patients with much better options. We just use the term FDA approved. What does FDA approved mean and how is that relevant here? Well, in the U.S., for example, we've had nine artificial discs that have gone through FDA trial, and three of them were uh, for a two-level disc replacement. So when they say it's approved by the FDA, it has undergone a very, very rigorous scientific evaluation. Usually it's a, a randomized in the beginning, it was randomized artificial disc diffusion. And then as we gain more and more experience, uh, they became randomized to now disc to another artificial disc. So it gives the patients, at least in the United States, the assurance that what we've tested has been rigorously studied. We have patients that have gone to Europe, but their FDA or their FDA-like uh, organization that approves their artificial disc and other, other uh, instrumentation is not nearly as rigorous as we are here in the US. And while it is easier to get approval for new designs in Europe, I'm actually very proud of the fact that when we offer our patient an artificial disc here, we can safely say that it has passed rigorous evaluation. And most of these studies now have to be followed out for seven and even 10 years. One of the interesting things about the FDA approval is that it approves a company's ability to market a product, distribute a product, but the FDA does not regulate what physicians and surgeons can do. So we as surgeons are not controlled by the FDA. So we often do things that are called off-label, which means the FDA trial is for a very specific indication for a one-level disc replacement, a two-level disc replacement, but we may choose and take a look and say, we need to do a three-level disc replacement, or we need to do what's called a hybrid, where we do a fusion and a disc replacement. And, and so that's not governed by the FDA, but it doesn't mean it's not a good approach or scientific. That's a really good point, Tom. The thing is, um, the FDA doesn't govern the practice of medicine. And I think as long as you have a discussion with the patient stating that, I think that this operation as you said, a hybrid, which would be a fusion at one level and maybe one or two artificial discs at another level is the best thing for you because of such and such. As long as the patient is informed and they understand that this is not according to the FDA approval, it doesn't mean to say that it still is not a good operation for a patient. And in fact, I'd venture to say that the four of us do a lot of off-label surgeries, but again, we discuss with the patient so that they're aware of the fact and understanding the difference between an FDA approved product and the practice of medicine, which is totally different and outside the FDA's purview. Absolutely. Todd, when we talk about that and off-label, such as a hybrid, where you're combining a fusion and an artificial disc, if artificial discs are so great, why would you ever not do artificial discs on everybody? Why would you bother doing a fusion? Well, sometimes the patient may have severe arthritis of a, of a disc level and the joints at that level that really make 
doing an artificial disc because you have to remember when we replace the disc with an artificial disc, we're relying on the two joints in the back of the spine to function normally. And sometimes those joints may be severely damaged and so damaged so much that they're not going to provide the stability necessary to help the artificial disc function normally. So sometimes we might say, hey, we need to fuse that one disc, but the one on next to it now also is the one we want to treat, and we can do an artificial disc there. In fact, there are, uh, well, there was one disc FDA approved next to fusion, and that was the PCM disc, uh, which has now been obsoleted and off the market. So there is a, a protocol standard in the FDA approval process for hybrid surgeries. There's an ongoing surgical uh, artificial disc trial now that also allows the artificial one level artificial to be placed next to a old fusion. Uh, that's called the uh, Synergy disc trial. And so there are uh, trials available, but as Dr. Geyer said, uh, the, the FDA does not regulate if we choose to use a device in an off-label manner, it's our duty to consent our patients and say, hey, now we're using this in an off-label manner because really what the FDA is doing is they're saying, hey, this device is safe and effective. And if the physician chooses to use it in an off-label manner, the FDA doesn't care. That's the doctor and patient relationship decision to make. So we can do that. I think the hangup comes with insurance companies because they like to use the FDA approval rating mm -hmm. as the method of approving the surgeries. And then they call everything else experimental when really it's not because there have been numerous publications on hybrid surgeries. And in fact, they're very safe and effective. I, in fact, am a hybrid. I have a fusion at C67 and I have an artificial disc at C56 and my neck works beautifully and I'm very happy. And I think you're a hybrid doctor. That's true. I have I have two artificial discs in my neck and two fusions. So I mean, I think this this concept of hybrid is important for the public to understand that it's a great opportunity to treat the problems. When we talk about a disc, we have to understand, as Dr. Lamon said, when you when you have a disc, you also have two little joints in the back called facet joints. So I always think of every level of the spine as a three-legged stool. And, and you need all three legs intact for it to work properly. And what we do with the disc replacements is put in a new disc in the front, a metal one with plastic, or, or we, uh, there's also one with ceramic core that we can use. But we put in this new disc, but we still rely on those two joints in the back. So those two joints in the back have to function properly or somebody won't get a good result. And, and so that's important to understand. So Dr. Kachatarian, when, when people are, are getting and you're talking to them, how do you decide whether they're going to get a fusion or an artificial disc or a combination? Before I can answer your question regarding what, you know, what kind of options we offer, what makes me decide in terms of whether we should do a dish replacement or fusion, I just wanted to add one more point regarding hybrids. So hybrids can be performed in a primary setting where a patient has a multi-level problem in their neck and one level may be amenable to a fusion and another one may be amenable to disc replacement. And uh, Dr. Landman described that scenario very nicely, but it is also uh, common for me to see patients in my clinic and I'm sure we all see in our clinics where patients have had prior fusions performed. They come back to us with a problem next to that fusion needing more surgery and this, I think, is another beautiful application of uh, motion preservation mm -hmm. technique that artificial disc replacement offers us to uh, perform this type of secondary hybrid surgery, disc replacement next to a prior fusion. Now, again, just as uh, Todd Landman mentioned, it becomes somewhat challenging at times to get the, something like this approved with insurance companies, but it's one where uh, I have done many peer reviews with insurance companies and tried to get them approved because I believe it's going to provide them better function in the long term to have an artificial disc replacement next to a fusion. Now, going back to answering your uh, question that you had Before you do, can, can you explain to the public why it would be good for them to have an artificial disc next to a fusion? You know, as we talked about, there are five discs in your neck. So if you've had one or two level already fused, you've already lost significant portion of your motion in the cervical spine. So then now you've developed a, a problem next to that. So 
uh, we all believe that there's this domino effect that happens with fusion. You lose motion at one or two segments, you put a lot of stress at the next level. And then if you keep fusing it, uh, it's, I've seen certainly in the past, some patients who've had their entire neck fused. And at that point in time, the only way they can turn is by turning their lower back or their thoracic or middle back to be able to look from side to side. So preserving the functional aspect of our cervical spine, which is motion is critical. So if we can address this additional level that now has become diseased with artificial disc, we are effectively giving that patient a new lease on life to be able to continue to function and be able to you know, look around their environment and do the daily activities of their life without, uh, without the stiffness that comes along with fusion. The problem with fusions are that you put increased stress in the levels above and the FDA studies have shown that there's a much higher rate of needing surgery at an adjacent level with the fusion compared to artificial disc. It's about one third to one quarter the chance. And that's why what Armin said is a great solution for, for those patients that had a previous fusion and now they come back and they wear out the next level. And one thing we didn't say earlier, just like if you had an arthritic hip today and you went in to see a surgeon and he said, well, I think you need a fusion. Well, you would turn around and walk outside because there's no way everybody gets an artificial hip or artificial knee. We're getting very close to that way in the cervical spine. One of the great studies that came out in the past uh, couple of years was showing that how effective and beneficial spinal surgery is on improving the quality of lives. And, and we've all known that hip replacements and knee replacements really improve the quality of people's lives. Well, this study actually showed that spine surgery, modern spine surgery, and I think a lot of it's because of disc replacements, but, but all the minimally invasive techniques we do, that spine surgery is even more successful than hip and knee surgery in improving the quality of lives. And I think it's these concepts of motion preservation, decreasing stress on the adjacent levels, and then being able to focus exactly with very extreme surgical precision on the problem and solving it and solving it with a device that works much like the normal anatomy that we can take out a degenerated broken part and put in a brand new part and have it work as good as the other one and get people back to their lives. And so that, that to me is so important and why we're celebrating and discussing cervical disc replacements tonight. And, yeah. and it used to be said that fusion was the gold standard, but that is uh, very quickly being challenged by artificial disc. And I would say, you know, of course, the four of us here would believe that disc replacement is a gold standard, but, you know, unless you have certain severe cervical conditions, the artificial disc is really our go-to operation. And, and I think all of us believe that we find reasons not to do the artificial disc. In other words, if a patient has a problem, we, we say, okay, well, you know, you pass all the, the tests, so you're a great candidate for artificial disc, not that, oh, you're a fusion patient, maybe you're a candidate for disc. Correct. Yeah, but, but I think it's important to understand that fusions aren't bad. No, no, they're disc not bad replacements are just better. Yeah, and just that, as you alluded to, Tom, that, you know, the body likes motion. That's the way the good Lord made us is to have motion, not to fuse our body parts and just like hip to knees. And again, I think, Tom, you asked me the question, you know, how do I make the, you know, the decision whether someone should get a fusion or a disc replacement? There are a few, I think, fairly, at least in my practice, uncommon, because when I look at the uh, proportion of the disc replacements that I do versus fusion. Currently, my practice is over 95% disc replacement in the cervical spine and less than 5% fusion. But the few patients who actually end up having a fusion do have some sort of a pathology that the artificial disc will not address. One that would be if that patient has what we call clinical instability. So that is, they are so mobile, they have so much motion at that segment that if you were to put an artificial disc in there, that continued uh, kind of pathologic motion or abnormal motion would continue and would be to the detriment of the patient's overall function. So a patient like that, whether that's as a result of some sort of excessive degeneration and wear and tear, or as a result of some sort of trauma, is still better treated with fusion. Uh, a patient who may have uh, excessive arthritis along those two legs on the back of the spine that you talked about. So if they have really severe facet arthritis, that makes their neck pain to the point where by replacing the disc, we will still uh, not address the majority of their neck pain. That may be a patient that may be better served with fusion. A patient that may have uh, really abnormal kind of surface to the 
to the disc end plates or kind of the underlying surface of the bone that precludes that patient from an artificial disc, that may be someone that we may still end up doing the fusion. So I think fusion will still continue to have a role in our practice. But fortunately for some of us, especially in this forum today, who have used the artificial disc technology and have expanded our abilities and our technique are now will use artificial disc as our primary treatment option and fusion only as kind of as our backup. So I, I have some online questions that have come in. Here's one from Tampa, Florida. And, and the question is, um, do I have to go to Europe to get a disc replacement or, or why would I go, why would I get it done in the United States versus Europe? When I uh, first opened up the Dish Replacement Center in 2014, that was a very, very common scenario here in Salt Lake City, Utah, as well as in the surrounding areas that it, commonly I would hear patients that were traveling to Europe to get artificial discs. So part of my focus, uh, both locally in Utah, as well as kind of along the West, was to really focus on educating my patient population, informing them that this option is available to us here. It's been available in the United States. The first artificial disc was approved in 2007. So now it's almost 14 years. Uh, so we have the technology here. We have the expertise here. And at, at the current time, really, I, I, I see really no reason why a patient should be traveling to Europe to get a, any type of cervical disc replacement, both the, uh, the options as well as the experience as well as the, uh, the te techniques is available here in the United States. Todd, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, most insurance companies happily approve cervical artificial disc replacement here in the United States. One and two level is very easy for I'd say most of the, the insurance companies to authorize. So your, your health insurance should provide authorization. The other thing I wanted to mention about these artificial discs in the cervical spine, because we were relating it a little bit to like a hip replacement, which might last 25 years. These artificial discs, some of them have lasted have been on the machines for 70 life years. So they're really a one-time thing. They really don't wear out at least the hardcore uh, polymers that are most of the discs that are FDA approved except one. Um, and so, and, and possibly the ceramic it, it will last as long as well. Um, but so they're really, it's a one-time thing if they're placed properly by a skilled surgeon in the right area to treat the right condition. And most of these never need to be revised. So it's a very satisfying operation, Tom. So Rick, let's talk about multiple levels because the FDA had one and two level studies, the insurance companies fairly regularly authorize one and two level study or one and two level treatments. What about the people that have three or more levels? Can you talk about that? You know, it, it happens, you know, people, you know, they're not cookie cutters. They don't, you know, come out of, the, out of the factory, so to speak, and just have one and two level disease as they get older. Um, so three level is not uncommon. Four level is, is certainly lesser. Um, and, you know, we do do that many uh, disc replacements. It's not common. I mean, we don't do a lot, but there are some individuals that are truly candidates for that. And the option for them used to be, well, you do a three or four level fusion. And as uh, Todd said, we only have five order or five discs in our neck. So if you do a four level fusion, guess what? That last disc that may or may not be normal is toast and we'll need another operation. So it's not common. And, you know, your insurance is probably not going to pay for a four level unless you have some extraordinary situation with your insurance or self-insured. But uh, yeah, it, it's a reasonable option. It's, you know, obviously not as common as two level. And I, you know, in my practice, I probably do as many two levels as one levels, you know, not that many threes and, you know, fours are rare. The insurance companies over the past five to 10 years have been much more uh, diligent in gathering outcomes data. And uh, some of the data that's been published does show that artificial disc patients cost less money to the insurer and their outcomes are better. So I've used some of that data to then, uh, if I have a patient comes to me who needs a three level disc replacement, or if a patient needs a disc replacement next to prior fusion to then, uh, even, though if it's, it, even though it's not part of the insurance uh, company's policy guidelines to cover these hybrid surgeries or to cover three or four level surgeries, uh, I will insist on having a peer-to-peer -peer review with the insurance company's representative, who usually on the other end, if we can ask for it and get it as a spine surgeon, you can make an argument to have them pay for this off-label or three-level surgeries, and not uncommonly, I've been able to get them approved. And 
in the case where we can't get it approved, some of these patients have looked at Europe to possibly go to Europe to get a three or four level of surgery performed. It, there used to be a time where perhaps traveling to Europe cost a little bit less money, but I believe now, especially with the cervical spine surgery, many of these surgeries are being done on an outpatient setting. The costs of having these procedures done in the United States are equivalent, if not less, than they are to travel to Europe. Do you um, have any experience in converting an artificial disc to a fusion or a fusion to an artificial disc, or maybe a, a one that didn't heal pseudarthrosis? I've had two patients uh, in my recent, one was about two years ago and one was about a year ago, who've had prior fusion performed and they did not heal. And I, I felt it was uh, almost nature fighting uh, what was uh, done unjustly by uh, fusing a segment that wanted to move. And uh, in those patients, I had a conversation with them and uh, took them back to the operating room. And uh, really the strategy was we will go in there, we will take out what has not fused. And, and if the, the environment within that disc was still amenable, you know, and without going into technical details of what that means, but if the environment was still amenable for an artificial disc that I would convert them to artificial disc and I was able to successfully convert them to artificial disc. And those patients went on to heal and have done incredibly well, have sent me many cards, many patients of uh, friends and family members and other colleagues. So yes, that can be done. Uh, the, on the flip side, if you have occasionally a patient who has received an artificial disc and for whatever reason, either it was done improperly or the sizing was not correct and they've had a failure, uh, then those patients may need additional surgery at that level. Uh, some of those I have converted them to uh, another artificial disc and, uh, and uh, achieved more proper positioning, more proper sizing and have done well as well. And I've had two patients who've had artificial discs that uh, then once they were taken out, the amount of damage that uh, had occurred on, to the underlying bone was such that it could not support an artificial disc. Those patients were then converted to fusion. I've been reversing fusions, um, well, failed fusions, and and some people that were like we were talking about who have you know three and four levels already fused and they're so restricted. And I had one woman uh, that in the first one came to see me, she had a, four, a three level fusion and her C6-7 was normal, but it had failed because of the stress load on it. And she wanted an artificial disc at cervical 6-7 and asked me, hey, is it possible to change one of my fusions to an artificial disc? And when I did the CAT scan, which is critical to assess the facet joints to make sure they still look open and healthy, well, they were at the one above at C5-6 so I was able to cut out that fusion, which was solid, and place an artificial disc there as well as at C6-7. So then she went from a three-level fusion down to a two, and actually she can play golf again because she can get her head down. So she's very happy, and that was eight years ago. So you can, you can convert selected patients, but yeah, I, uh, but like Armin has done, and I know Rick has done, you know, we, if you have a pseudarthrosis or a failed fusion, most of those convert quite well to artificial discs. So I have a very large series and, and they, they do, like Armin said, they just very happy patients and they keep their mobility. They regain some mobility. They have no, their pain scores are superb. They're, they're very grateful patients. So we have a question here from up in New York City. So Rick, if you can comment, the question is, how do I find a surgeon that can do an artificial disc and do all surgeons, do all spine surgeons do artificial discs? Well, not all surgeons do the artificial disc and you're gonna to have to do a little bit of research, but like any other surgical procedure, you wanna to go to a, a spine surgeon who has experience, not just a little experience, a lot of experience, because I think we, we all know the more you do, the better you get. And it's that way for any type of surgical procedure. So it's gonna take a little bit of research. And you know, I know there's lots of social media areas, but you can also be very frank and honest if you go to see a spine surgeon and say, hey, you know, do you do a lot of these artificial discs? And if he says, well, you know, I do maybe one a month, that's really not good enough. And then ask him honestly, say, listen, if I was your, your mother or I was your sister or brother, um, who would you go to? Who, who are the big, you know, artificial disc gurus? And that's what you need to do. I, I mean, I personally have had a couple surgeries and I've always gone 
out of town uh, to the people that had the most experience. It never hurts to get additional opinions. And uh, uh, I think what COVID has done over the past year, it uh, provided us a platform to do telemedicine quite commonly. And uh, I, at least I would say once or twice a week, I'm doing telemedicine consultation with patients out of my area who have seen another surgeon and have been offered fusion and then provide them my honest opinion, whether they're good candidates for artificial dish replacement. If they are, they may ask to either come out and have surgery here in Utah an alternative would be if I could recommend someone in their area who is perhaps known to me as a colleague who does artificial this, and that would be another option that I can offer to them. But that's an option that's available to, I think, most of our patients. If they're being told that they need fusion, I always uh, uh, advise them to get at least another one or two opinions and see if they would be good candidates for artificial discs. Uh, and Tom, the other thing is, Patients are becoming better and better educated because as Armin said, we see, and I see a lot of patients for second opinion that have been told they needed a fusion. And they said, you know, I was reading about the artificial disc and it doesn't make sense. You know, we ha and, and they go back to the hip joints and the knee joints. So we see a lot of second opinion patients seeking the artificial disc too. Right, I, I have patients out here in California. They will come in, they are so educated here because they want to live this active lifestyle. And they want to keep mobility. And they'll come in and tell me, Tom, they'll, they'll say, I, I want this particular disc of the six discs that are currently on the market uh, and available. They'll say, I would I prefer to have this specific implant. And you know, that's how, how educated people are getting. So they are doing their research and that internet has been helpful. And as Armin mentioned, with the telemedicine, we're, we're doing a lot of out-of-state consults and people that are... I, you know, many times where people are told they have to have a fusion or not a candidate. And I look at their films and I guarantee everybody on this panel, and you're like, you're a perfect artificial fist candidate. I don't know what they're talking about. So it's always good to seek out experts who have done lots of these. I recommend skilled surgeons who do many, at least 50 plus, you know, uh, 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 for, I recommend the patients to go to. They can't just go to a guy who dabbles and disc replacement. Even though artificial disc surgery may sound similar in its technique or its approach to cervical fusion, uh, I think artificial disc surgery is so uh, dependent upon really doing the proper technique and the proper sizing and the proper positioning of the implant so that it functions uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper way. Uh, that is one of the keys to uh, a successful outcome with artificial discs. And in fact, you know, as I've uh, been asked on a number of occasions to review some of the failures uh, of the discs, or I've seen patients in my practice who've had artificial discs done uh, elsewhere, uh, most of the failure doesn't happen because the implant failed. Uh, most of the failures that I see have happened because of inappropriate application of the implant either in a patient who didn't have the right indications for that particular surgery, or even if they had the right indications, it's just that the surgery itself from the technical perspective was not done correctly. They were improperly sized or improperly positioned and those discs may fail. So I think the experience aspect of doing artificial discs, just like it, it, it is true for hip replacements and knee replacements, we keep going back to that. Uh, if I needed a hip or knee replacement, I certainly would find the surgeon who has tremendous amount of experience and has good outcomes with that particular procedure and go have that surgeon do my hip or knee replacement. Same thing applies in the, in the, in the spinal artificial discs. A fusion is very forgiving, whereas the artificial disc is not forgiving. And that's why it, you just can't pick it up and say, oh yeah, I can do it, I can do a fusion because it, it is much more technically demanding than a fusion. And uh, a lot of factors go into the decision-making, what prosthesis you're gonna use, what kind of stability does the patient have? What's their anatomy look like? What's gonna be the best fit? And again, position it properly. So with the fusion, it's basically clean the disc out real fast and put whatever fusion device you, know, you need and put a plate on. So not that that's simple, and I don't mean to minimize it you know, for people that do fusion, but doing an artificial disc, particularly in the cervical spine is much more demanding. Cervical fusions, are a standard operation, they're technically demanding, but they're very forgiving. It's, it's, you don't have to be as perfect and precise. Disc replacement surgery needs extreme dedication, skill, and perfection.
to get the implant in the right place, use the proper implant and, and, and get it to succeed. So it's important for the public to understand that a disc replacement is a harder operation to perform, more technically demanding, but it has a significant reward to the patient at the end when done properly. There's all these different implants have gone through. We've had multiple generations of implants. Um, is there a difference in the implants and, and how do you choose an implant for a patient? I'd like each of the panelists to answer that. Well, each, each implant uh, functions a bit differently. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to go through all six of the implants at, at the moment, but I mean, um, the anatomy depends. So typically in the lower cervical spine, I'll, if the patient has a high angle slope on the standing x-rays, I'm getting a little technical here, but I want a disc that's going to resist shearing or sliding because there's that tendency. So I use more of a fixed core artificial disc that will allow and help resist shear to protect the joints and the nerves a bit better. And then as I go higher, I'll often pick a slightly more mobile core to provide the more functional mobility that the patient needs. And sometimes the compressible core as I get higher up as well. So each level kind of depends a lot on the anatomy and selecting the proper device, I believe optimizes outcomes and placing them properly, as you mentioned, Tom, is so critical. It's, and it's much more difficult to place these things in the right positions, but knowing this, what we call the center of rotation, where the disc needs to be to allow the vertebrae to roll normally is critical. And like with hip replacements, you know, there are doctors that do hip replacements, but then there are doctors that do the revision hip replacements and they're different guys. And so I think we would classify ourselves as revision guys and initial implantation guys, both because we have that experience. So that field gets smaller if you've had a disc that's failing on who's really going to be the expert for the patient to select at that time. Tom, in my practice, I currently use four different discs. I've become very proficient at all of them. And uh, uh, I use MoBC, I use ProDisc C, I use Simplify, and uh, most recently I've been using M6. And uh, I think along the way, as I heard my colleagues, I've heard uh, Todd talk about some of the discs that he has used. I've talked to Rick, some of the discs that he has used, and also colleagues across the world. And you know what I can say that we don't have the perfect disc yet. Uh, we don't have a disc that is the absolute champion, the Olympic champion of discs, but I do think that we have some very, very good discs that uh, used uh, in, with proper indications in certain patients, given whatever the given pathology is, as well as a number of different other parameters regarding the alignment, et cetera. Uh, so what I try to do is, uh, uh, as a result of my experience, as well as as a result of uh, observing some of my colleagues use variety of different discs in different environments, I, I feel like I've, I've become fairly good in being able to choose the right disc for the right patient. And uh, I think Todd alluded that a lot of patients will come to us having either been marketed to or having done some research and wanting a certain disc. And if that happens to be a good disc that is, uh, you know, fits them, you know, fits their needs well, I have no problem providing that surgery to them. But if I believe that another disc is going to give them a better outcome, I, I will certainly explain to them and educate them as to why I believe that this other disc may be a better option for them and then go on to uh, have that surgery performed with a disc that I believe will give them that best outcome. And we do use a variety of discs and we try to you know, custom fit each one to the patient. But on the other hand, just to bring us back down to earth, I have to quote one of our colleagues that says, it doesn't make any difference. Just learn one, do it well, uh, perform the operation the best you can. And if you think about it, you know, that's better than someone mastering uh, or being a master of none. In other words, you know, just choosing willy nilly any, any different disc or the new disc that comes out. And I think his point was that whatever disc you use, just make sure as Armin said, you know the ins and outs, you have perfected the technique and you, you understand why you're using one over another one. And when you do use it, you're doing it the best that you can do. The technology has evolved and the current generations are much better than where we started. And, and I think that, that they do a great job but we all know that there'll be more technology that'll come along. At some point, we will have uh, implantable artificial discs that are human 
derived, 3D printed. And so, you know, we, we're eager to get those days. That, They're already working on right, that. Right, right. And, and so, you know, someday that'll be there. That's not realistic. So if you have a spine problem today, I don't think you need to wait for a theoretical advance that's coming that may not be available for 20 years, 30 years. You got to continue to live your life and your health depends on that. If you can't move, you can't take care of yourself. You can't stay healthy. And if your heart gives out because you didn't exercise because you're hurt, then you've lost everything as well as the quality of life. I mean, we, we have 10 year follow up on three artificial discs. And, and as you said, there's no reason to wait because these artificial discs, as they were done, designed and the ones that are 10 years old are not, you know, our current generation. So they're just getting better and better. That's exciting. So I'd like to give, give our three experts here a chance to say whatever they want to say about spinals healthcare or cervical uh, disc replacements or whatever. So we'll give you each a, a three uh, chance to give some parting words to the public. I believe that in the next five to 10 years, when we call the insurance companies, and if we're asking them for a fusion, they're going to be saying, why aren't you doing the artificial disc? I believe the whole parameter is going to turn. Where now, when we say we want to do an artificial disc, they say, why don't you want to do the fusion? Even though we get paid more to do the fusion, we get paid less, believe it or not, to do an artificial disc, which is much more challenging and skillful uh, to place. But I believe that's going to change because the outcomes, as Dr. Geyer and Armin said, and Tom, you know, the, the studies, the 10-year studies just show the, tech, the superior outcomes of neck pain, arm pain, neurologic success, overall success are far superior to fusion and the adjacent level surgeries are two and a half times less with artificial disc compared to fusion. So uh, Tom, uh, uh, my uh, pointing words for our uh, patients out there who may be listening to us today is that uh, I'm, as I've gotten older myself, because when I look at myself as a younger surgeon, it seems like uh, I had perfect health myself and uh, uh, things didn't seem as real. But now uh, in, in my 50s, uh, it would not be uncommon for me to get up in the morning and have stiffness in my back or in my neck. And I realize how important motion it is to my well-being and how important it is for me to do all the things that I love to do, whether it's being at work and taking care of my patients or going out there and mountain biking or golfing or skiing. So it becomes more and more real uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a physician and a surgeon who's maturing to understand how important motion and function it is to our well-being. And uh, when we talk about artificial discs, uh, really this is an, an, an option that allows us to take care of the patient's symptoms and do so with much better functional outcomes. Uh, again, for the long, long time, cervical fusion was the probably the gold standard and the king of spinal surgery. But I believe now that uh, that particular crown has been uh, has been displaced, and artificial disc is the current king of the spinal surgery. It really is great technology, and I think that you know if you do have a neck or arm problem and you've been suffering with, and you're thinking, well, I don't want to have surgery, you at least owe it to yourself to visit a spine specialist, to see what your options are. And I'm not saying you should have surgery, but if it's something that it can improve your quality of life and let you get back to doing the things that you love to do, it is a wonderful, wonderful operation. Um, and I always tell patients, it's really your quality of life that determines whether or not you should do the surgery. And a lot of patients say, well, I'm in my 50s, it's okay, I'm gonna slow down, or I'm in my 60s. Um, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Not that we can bring back the fountain of youth, but at the same time, we can improve your quality of life. And this is a proven technology that in the right hands is safe and long-term results are excellent. This has been excellent. I'd like to thank Dr. Geyer, Dr. Lamon, Dr. Kachetarian. I think that we have opened a lot of knowledge and shared it from four experts who have decades of experience in this to help people understand the benefits of this incredible technology my advice, my closing words are, if you can keep motion, keep it. And I think that this technology is great. Find experts who are proficient at it. And, and with that, I think that you can regain your life. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody and look forward to the next part of our spine series on Spine Talks. So thank you all.